The Junior Bar Conference of the American Bar Association was founded in August 1934. At the initial meeting, it was encouraged to foster similar organizations in local and state bars and to serve as a training ground to those members who might later participate in the management and affairs of the association. Seventy-five years later, the YLD is the largest and most important entity within the ABA, and it is safe to say that it is just getting started. I was national chair of the junior bar. Uh, my annual meeting was 1953. I was preceded, not directly, but people like Lewis Powell, for example, and uh, Charlie Ryan were outstanding leaders uh, in every sense of the word. Back in those ancient times, the biggest job we had was to increase membership and activity of young lawyers in the Junior Bar Conference because there just weren't that many of us. You know, the emphasis was to increase participation by uh, younger lawyers in the ABA, which was difficult to do unless there was a, an active Junior Bar group. I had to go around and, and meet with executive directors of state bars simply trying to get them to support the young lawyers in their state. What is the importance of the Young Lawyers Division? It's a judicious thorn in the side of the senior bar to try to identify deficiencies in the practice of law as the senior bar had become comfortable to enjoy and try to do something about changing it. Well, I think it's made the ABA more sensitive to issues that it might not have been earlier knowledgeable or interested in. Young Lawyers Division is the heart and soul of this organization and the conscious of this organization. It showed me that going to law school was more than just about making money. Um, we did a lot of good things. The Young Lawyers Division lends a far greater service than people realize because it's not only producing future lawyers for the association, it's producing and grooming future lawyers for communities across this country. I think the YLD's greatest contribution is it provides the primary force of energy in the American Bar Association. I think it has stimulated interest in the organized bar and added to the ranks of the lawyers who participate in the work of the ABA. Young lawyers, for the most part, make some of the most dedicated long-term members of the association. So for the future health and membership of the association, for the future health and leadership of the association, it's vital that the YLD maintain its strength and, and vitality. When we met, we really met and we had a lot of people there. All the OP conferences were so much fun. I mean, and everybody wanted to attend. I think we had to limit attendance sometime. We'd start very early in the morning. We'd have breakout sessions on the topics we wanted to teach the affiliates about. We'd have wonderful social events. <laughs> and we all became very close friends, whether the affiliate leaders were in, involved in the YLD or not, because we would always be in contact. And so it was always sort of a semi-reunion. <laughs> For two or three years, right, we did our wars which was forum for affiliates to come and showcase their affiliates as potential meeting sites. Now, if you were going to build a real beach on the ballroom floor, wouldn't you ask for a little help? Maybe a piece of plastic? Or permission. Or How about permission? permission? The hotel comes in and oh they're just gosh. screaming. Because, of course, they've got another session or a wedding. I think my all-time favorite AOP meeting probably was the one in Baltimore in 1982. Uh, the host committee was just tremendous. They had gone out and obtained something like 300 box seat tickets for the Preakness. And so that was our Saturday afternoon activity in Baltimore was to go to the Preakness. We went tubing down the hooch, which is, and we got rafts for all the international lawyers and all the affiliates. Then the English stole the beer from the French and we had this big incident. One of the stories, by the way, that gets told is my ill-fated trip when I took us to Mexico and we had the uh, boat trip from hell to the island where a torrential rainstorm blew in, the transformer blew out, and the grass hut caught on fire. A girl unnamed at this point just kept shouting over and over, get out of the hut, get out of the hut, get out of the hut. <laughs> a guy going around on the boat with a parrot on his shoulder, 
trying to get people to chug tequila. Janet Jackson, at one point, I was sitting across from her, and whatever happened, this boat rolled or something, but Janet's chair went like this. Right over. And her feet, feet up in the air, straight up in the air. <laughs> Sorry, Janet. <laughs> and it, this is just the start of this wonderful <laughs> evening. People got Montezuma's revenge. That was a raucous, uh, hellacious, wild time, which, uh, you know, Barb Danielson uh, helped me plan that, and so she and I should be convicted together for it, I think. <laughs> we may have been the last ones to uh, go to bed, but we were always the first ones up to uh, conduct business. You know, when I went to law school, there weren't any women allowed by law school, which was ridiculous. There were not that many women. Uh, that were active at all. I was a delegate of the LA County Barristers, they called them then, and I walked into the Young Lawyers Section House of, I forget what they called it, House of Delegates or whatever, and they were in alphabetic order and California obviously was way up close, so I had to walk, and it was a little late, had to walk through the entire group of 400 some odd men, and I think there were three or four other women, to hoots and hollers, particularly from the Texas delegation, who had then somehow named me Sweet Baby Jane. Well, I met Betty Braislin and Susan French, and they said, this is crazy. So we went to the uh, then chairman, who I'm sure was Harry Hathaway, and said, we need a women's rights committee because we're not going to put, take out, you know, put up with this anymore. And that was the first women's rights committee. Jane uh, uh, is a very spirited person. Uh, she came with a, uh, a California spirit, which uh, to some lawyers like me from Fort Worth, Texas, was a new and endearing thing. And she had a pugnaciousness. Uh, no one was going to tell Jane what to think or what to do. And uh, no one was going to stop that unbridled energy from making it to the chair. I do remember vividly I ran against a man from Philadelphia named Steve Waxman, who remains a friend of mine today. And it was a, a race at the beginning, and he came up to me one day and said, you know, I, I really want you to win because you're a woman, and we need to break this chain of white males being chair. And he withdrew. You know, I think I would have won anyhow. <laughs> Steve, I would have won anyhow. But on the other hand, he realized how momentous that it was going to be. In 79, you could count the lawyers of color on one hand at an annual meeting. In 1972, my wife and I walked into a room of, it was just absolutely packed, of outstanding young lawyers from all over the United States. There were three of us, three African Americans, uh, that were present. They were, these were the only lawyers of color that I recall being there. At the time, we were terribly weak on diversity. I mean, but for Dennis and his courage, and then somebody like Sam Johnson came along, who, you know, just you, you, wonderful personalities that would overcome the natural bias. Harry Hathaway uh, and the leaders of the Young Lawyers section just made my participation as well as presence feel right at home. The association's efforts in the diversity area began in the Young Lawyers. Uh, and that was the brainchild of Jane Barrett. Janie said, I'm going to change the complexion of the ABA and Dennis is going to help me do it. We're going to start recruiting people of color. And she gave us $3,000. We started recruiting other people of color. Janie even had a big, uh, in 1980, she had the first uh, conference on minority lawyers and invited every top honcho from the country who was a lawyer of color. To come. And through the Young Lawyers diversity efforts came the Task Force on Diversity, the ABA Task Force, which was peopled with a lot of young lawyers, and out of that came the Commission on Minorities and the Commission on Women. The young lawyers were at the forefront. They were really the reason why the ABA has advanced in terms of its diversity initiative, and also in terms of really reaching out to bars of color, people of color, and bringing them into the association. As hard as we played and had fun and, and hung around together at the social events and all the good times, uh, the work came first. And every time that there was an issue that came up, that you needed the volunteer and the enthusiasm of lawyers, it was something that was given to the young lawyer section. And I think one of the things I enjoyed most was <clears throat> getting out and we repainted some centers and, and did some actual hands-on work. 
that time were particularly active in what we call bridge the gap programs which helped uh, graduates from law school just entering the bar. We continued the disaster relief program. It was important and developed a significant program which we were able to get through the House of Delegates to require for accreditation that there be a fixed number of personnel in the placement office because uh, law schools allocating funding uh, didn't uh, necessarily look at the placement role as important. My favorite public service project that we've done was the AIDS initiative that we had during Christina Plum's year. It didn't seem to be relevant to me or to connect to me, but I thought I'd give it a chance. And so what I did was um, I helped found a pro bono clinic in Memphis uh, for folks living with HIV and AIDS. And when I got to meet the people uh, that were facing that in my own hometown, uh, it really had a deep impact on me. One guy in particular was uh, living in public housing. His family had disowned him. Um, because he was gay. He was at the last stages of his life suffering from AIDS and had just decided he was ready to die and was not taking his medication. The problem was when he was off his medication he'd get a fever on that he'd wind up uh, blind and, and a lot of times he wound up stripping down because he was so hot and they would find him frequently in the hall of the public housing project that he lived in crying for help and the day that we were going into the hearing to evict him he turned and looked at me and said I don't want to die homeless. And you want to talk about pressure. That was some of the most pressure I've ever felt in my entire life. And we were able to keep him um, in the apartment that he had, and he passed away about six months after that. And that project, probably more than any other, just from my own personal standpoint, touched me. I think the whole concept of the affiliate outreach project and the, the highlighting and showcasing of different projects was great contribution. Um, you know, it was really before the internet. It was before you could share project ideas efficiently. Uh, and so people would come and you know, we'd, have the, we'd basically have a warehouse of, of projects. We could activate local entities and the ABA didn't have that capacity. So whenever they wanted you know, something to be activated on the local level, they came to the Young Lawyers Division. We took the AOP idea to the senior bar and that really started the uh, BLI. That came from the young lawyers. Uh, yeah, we were just young people out to have a good time. Uh, my, my good friend now deceased, Oliver Hurd, used to describe that certain things should only occur at night and they were best not repeated. So I can talk about some of these to a certain extent, but uh, out of almost a mutual blackmail, there are some things that will never be told. Of course, the one that everyone always recalls and we celebrated the 30th anniversary of this year was the meeting at the Plaza Hotel in New York, uh, where for some, some quirk of fate, we ended up with the most fabulous suite in the Plaza. I have these great images. There was Clark Wadlow on top of the grand piano, uh, shirtless. He had just had heart surgery, so it's just, you know, scarred up, but he was dancing all night on top of that piano. There was somebody, there was a ledge outside, outside, there was a ledge. We were 20 stories up, I don't know, at the plaza. Somebody balanced on the ledge, dancing. I don't know if that party ever ended, actually, Bill. You'd have to tell me, because when I walked out, it was still in full swing. There's something I don't want to repeat. <laughs> like, how did the piano get from one floor to another floor? <laughs> Which I'm not sure I know either, but... Maesong Kem Fong Restaurant. Uh, Chinese restaurant. Uh, a lot of young people. Uh, a lot of us uh, for the first time um, in a city like Montreal. The service there was not what it should have been. The food was sort of uh, sparse, but lots of sake. I remember going back to the owner of this restaurant and saying, you don't understand. If you don't get some food and stop serving them sake, they're going to destroy <laughs> your restaurant. <laughs> At that point, I went back into the dining room. They had these huge medallions on the wall, which they were taking off and they were playing Wheel of Fortune. Oh my goodness. With napkins on their heads. You had some good times. <laughs> oh. You know the other half of it. Anything else that you want to disclose to us? Now, do you think I've recently lost my mind? <laughs> do you think I'm not going to put it on Facebook? <laughs> 
One of the best things about the junior bar in those days, and I hope it is still true, uh, and that was you met friends that you, I can attest you will have the rest of your life. The greatest thing for me has been the people. And I'm still friends with the people that I met at that very first conference. Uh, we've been to marriages and divorces and we've been to funerals and um, these are my best friends in the world. The Wild Dee is a magical place that if you are lucky enough to be introduced to it, you cannot ever be the same. I love the Wild Dee and uh, the people that were there and continue to be my friends now. I do not know of a section or division in the ABA that I regard as having made a greater contribution than I think the young lawyers have done. I'm proud that, that, that I can rock on the porch and see these younger people coming up who have done far more than just perpetuate. They, they are improving a great product and making it something better. Ah, oh, we love you guys. You have been a part of our lives and a part of our history. Those were the good old days. I get all choked up when I try to talk about the division, so um, it is and will always be my home.